In the 60s and 70s, the revolutionary struggle had its greatest scope. All this driven by men committed to the dream of a better life for their country and their land. In Cuba and Guatemala, we saw one of the greatest revolutionary struggles of all time, and the names of these people who would mark the history being charismatic leaders and very loved by the public, but that in moments of tension would show their true face, turning them into everything they once swore to fight. In this video, we will shed some light on the history of one of these great characters, Ernesto Guevara, better known as Che Guevara, a man who in his desire for adventure was present in the political changes of both countries and was influenced by his great journey throughout Latin America. As he went from being a well-off young Argentinian to a doctor in the trenches and one of the most powerful men in Cuba, stay and discover how he became a symbol of struggle for all the oppressed peoples of the world. To really know a revolutionary, we must look at his childhood and the challenges he had to overcome to understand his vision of the world and thus be able to identify with his mission and find inspiration in his struggle. However, Ernesto was not born a revolutionary. He was born on June 14, 1928, in Rosario, Argentina as the eldest of five brothers. He was part of an aristocratic family. His grandfather, Patricio Julian Lynch Iru, was the richest man in South America. His father had inherited all his property, which assured them a life of luxury and comfort. During his childhood, his father acquired yerba mate plantations, the famous Argentinian drink, and because of this constantly moving, was an obligation to be aware of the different plantations. However, he lived most of his life in Misiones, one of the 24 largest provinces of Argentina, located in the northeast of the country. His early years were normal. He was a beloved and celebrated child, Although he suffered from asthma since he was two years old due to the cold climate that prevailed in Caraguate, the city where the family mainly lived, the symptoms worsened, forcing the family to move to Córdoba, a warmer destination and with a higher altitude that favored Ernestito's health, as his relatives called him. Ernesto lived in Córdoba for 17 years, where he attended elementary and high school, and became a great fan of sports, which he practiced often. But due to his asthmatic condition, he was a victim of constant attacks that forced him to be bedridden sometimes for days. He became a fan of reading, mainly attracted to travel and adventure stories, which greatly influenced his rebellious and disobedient character. He always made his point of view known and ended up in fights with whoever had a different opinion. During the 1940s and the rise of the Peronist movement led by Juan Domingo Perón, a military and politician who sought to pass laws in defense of workers and their rights, a season of protests began in the country. Ernesto never took sides in these ideas. Although his family was completely anti-Peronist, he firmly believed that the protests were not something useful. In 1943, his best friend was arrested for participating in the protests in favor of Peronism, and demonstrations were held demanding the release of young people who had been deprived of their freedom. Ernesto only said that he would not attend these demonstrations and that the only way to do something for his friend was if he was given a revolver to free him by force. This radical thought deeply marked the path he would take throughout his life. Years later, he graduated as a doctor, and by the time of 1952, his desire for adventure intensified, and he made his first trip through Latin America on a motorcycle, along with his best friend Alberto Granado, a biochemistry student who had been Ernesto's friend for years. Alberto accompanied him on his trip in which he had direct contact with the most oppressed social sectors of America, he traveled through Argentina, Chile, Peru, Venezuela, and Guatemala, where he witnessed firsthand the great inequalities that existed between the social classes, thus influencing his already growing desire to bring about a change in people's lives. Ernesto lived nine months in Guatemala, where he tried to work as a doctor. But the country was going through a serious political crisis, and a coup d'etat was imminent, without the possibility of getting a job. His economic problems worsened, during his stay, he met many Latin Americans who had been exiled or persecuted for their beliefs. Among them was Hilda Gadea, a Peruvian militant leader of APRA, the Peruvian Aprista Party, who had been persecuted for her collaboration with Arbenz, the president of the country, who had initiated a series of agrarian policies that deeply affected the interests of North American companies in Guatemala. Hilda, who years later would be Ernesto's first wife, introduced him to other exiles. Among them, Edelberto Torres and Antonio Nico Lopez, a Cuban militant 
who had participated in the capture of the Moncada barracks under the orders of Fidel Castro in Cuba in 1953, and after the failure of the operation was forced to flee the country. Nico Lopez and Ernesto became close friends and were influenced by each other. Nico, who gave Ernesto the nickname Che for his excessive use of the word, considered him a great friend. And Ernesto, who had been greatly influenced by Nico's socialist beliefs, had developed a new vision for his life. In 1954, Ernesto traveled to El Salvador to renew his visa, and upon returning to Guatemala, he found a country in conflict. The attack against the Arbenz government had begun, and Ernesto joined the health brigades, offering help and care to the people involved in the conflict. Months later, and with a new government in Guatemala, Ernesto took refuge in the Argentine embassy. When he received his safe conduct, he was released and left in search of Hilda, who had been released days before. However, the relationship fractured, and a month later, in September, Ernesto left alone to Mexico. In Mexico, the destinies of Ernesto Che Guevara and Fidel Castro would finally intertwine. Ernesto, who had already remarried and had a daughter, was invited to join the 26th of July movement, led by Fidel Castro, to overthrow the government of Fulgencio Batista in Cuba and initiate a social revolution. Ernesto would serve as a doctor for the guerrilla group, and in early February 1956, he received military training and guerrilla tactics necessary for the conflict he would face months later. In November of the same year, he left with Fidel, his brother Raul Castro, and 80 members of the 26th of July movement aboard the Granma yacht in pursuit of Fidel Castro's vision of changing the course of Cuba's history. Upon arriving in Cuban territory, in the mountainous area known as Sierra Maestra, the weather played a dirty trick on Ernesto. His asthmatic condition that he suffered from childhood worsened, forcing him to fight not only against the forces of Fulgencio Batista, but also against his own body that was constantly failing him. Three years later, after dozens of confrontations, where the revolutionary movement had gained ground in its mission to overthrow Batista, Ernesto is one of the charismatic leaders of the movement on December 29, 1958. Fidel's forces take Santa Clara, the last important city before Havana, with an imminent defeat in his future. Fulgencio flees the country and leaves power in the hands of Fidel Castro. With the new government in Cuba at the hand of Fidel Castro, began what they called the purge of the corrupt government of Batista, making hundreds of revolutionary trials against former members of the government in which the sentence was to be shot immediately. It is believed that Ernesto carried out more than 500 shootings just a few months after Fidel took power in Cuba. For years, the trials continued, and although his actions were questioned by the UN, he did not stop and continued with his persecution against all political and military members who supported Fulgencio Batista. During the following years, he fought in different confrontations against the resistance that still remained in Cuban territory. Fidel, as recognition to his actions, named him Director of the Department of Industrialization, as well as President of the National Bank and Minister of Industries. With his experience acquired during the overthrow of Arbenz in Guatemala, Ernesto knew that the US government would not allow the reforms applied in the new government of Cuba. That is why he directly influenced the radicalization of the revolution in order to establish a socialist government and with the support of the Soviet Union to confront the US if necessary. Not only sympathizers of the fallen government of Fulgencio Batista were persecuted in Cuba's new political order, it is well known that homosexuals were not well received by Fidel Castro and Ernesto Guevara. Their behavior and debauchery in the public squares and streets of Cuba was severely punished. And their condition, as they described it, was a symptom of a disease that led to decadence and the destruction of society. In 1965, bored with his work as minister and banker, he informed Fidel Castro that he would go to the Democratic Republic of Congo in search of new frontiers and in search of spreading the revolution in new countries. In a letter, Che told Fidel that he felt that he had fulfilled his duty in the Cuban Revolution and that his presence was no longer necessary. However, he emphasized his love for the nation and his commitment to his ideals. He also resigned from the positions he held and wished them good fortune with a phrase that still lives on in the legacy of Fidel and Hugo Chavez, who followed in his footsteps later on. Hasta la victoria siempre was the farewell he left in the letter. Ernesto left for the Congo 
accompanied by 130 Cuban militants among the members of his close circle such as Carlos Coelho and Harry Villegas. But his presence was not well received by the Army of Liberation of Congo, who had no knowledge of his arrival and feared for the international implications that this would cause. Despite this, Ernesto settled in the area and tried to participate in the clashes. But his little knowledge of the language and customs made him a dirty trick. Disorganization and lack of discipline led him to suffer losses in his troops, forcing him to withdraw dishonorably from the African territory. For five months he lived in a safe house located in Prague, in the Czech Republic, where he re-evaluated his steps and strategies. It was there where the idea of exporting the Cuban Revolution to Bolivia came to his mind. Bolivia, which was a country with an excellent location, since it bordered with five other nations, was the perfect place to be conquered by the Cuban Revolution. That is how, on November 7, 1966, Ernesto settles in Bolivian territory, along with 47 men. They took the name of National Liberation Army of Bolivia, ELN. Four months after his arrival, the Bolivian government arrested two ELN deserters and interrogated them under torture. After extracting information about Ernesto's plans, the Bolivian government requested the support of the United States and neighboring countries, who offered intelligence and equipment to confront the ELN. Ernesto Guevara and his men assassinated seven soldiers on March 23, 1967, after which the army hunted them down. Intelligence bases were set up with US support and searches were carried out, frequently with the objective of locating the guerrillas or failing that, to force them to withdraw from the area. It is believed that the reason why the ELN failed to recruit new members for their cause was the lack of investigation by Che, since what he offered people as a reward for fighting by his side was the same that former revolutionaries had offered and none had succeeded, almost completely eliminating the interest of the Bolivian people to participate in their social revolution. On October 8, 1967, during a search encirclement, the remaining group of guerrillas under Ernesto Guevara's orders which had been reduced to 17 members, most of whom were sick or wounded, were ambushed in the Quebrada del Churo. Ernesto ordered them to split up and sent the wounded forward, while the rest defended them. The group fought for three hours, and Ernesto was wounded in the leg and captured together with the last of his men alive, a man known as Simeon Cuba, who was nicknamed Willie. The rest of the guerrillas who fled were pursued, and several of them fell days later. Only five managed to escape to Chile. After his capture, he was transferred to La Higuera, where he was held in a school used as an intelligence base. It is there where the CIA agents were informed of his capture when they received the radio code Papa Tired that had been assigned by the American intelligence to the guerrilla leader. After this, the agents flew to the locality and met with the prisoner. His possessions were retained. Among them were family photos, his asthma medicine, his diary, and a notebook with encrypted codes used for his communication with Cuba. Colonel Zenteno interrogated Ernesto, but could not get him to talk to him. Surprisingly, he had a small conversation with Felix Rodriguez, a CIA agent. Felix, in a recent interview, stated that he entered the classroom and addressed Ernesto with much respect, and clarified that he was not coming to interrogate him, but rather to talk to him, since he knew his trajectory and wanted to talk to the man who had been an enormous figure in the history of Cuba. Ernesto asked Felix to release him from the chains and let him sit down. After this, they had a short conversation. During this conversation, Felix asked him about his journey in the Congo and why he had chosen Bolivia for his next revolution. Ernesto only answered the questions he wanted and refused to talk about his plans and the strategies he once used. After this, Felix was called by Colonel Zenteno to inform him that his government had news for him. Felix was informed that the order from the United States was to keep Che alive as long as possible. But Zenteno's orders were different. At noon, President Barrientos gave the order to shoot the prisoners, and it was Felix who transmitted the information to Sergeant Tehran, who would be the executor of the sentence. Felix ordered the sergeant to shoot Che from the neck down, since the premise was that Che had died in combat. A few minutes later, the order was executed, and Ernesto Che Guevara was shot in a school classroom in a wooded area of Bolivia. His captured comrades suffered the same fate minutes before. Before the order was executed, Felix Rodriguez ordered that Che be taken out so that a picture could be taken. This picture would be known as the last picture of Che alive. For more than 50 years, 
Che Guevara has been recognized as a pure revolutionary who never betrayed his ideals. And although we now know that the socialist ideals have not worked in any of the governments that have been applied, it is truly admirable the dedication and courage that Ernesto represented during his life. His photo has been a symbol for decades of the struggle of the oppressed, and his message of revolution is printed on every product that has been sold with his image. His life has been the inspiration for countless poems, songs and movies, as well as the places he visited have been preserved and are worshipped today, even in Bolivia, where he met his end. There are multiple places and roads where he is honoured for his efforts and sacrifice. His remains rest in Santa Clara, Cuba, in the mausoleum of Che Guevara, where they are honoured for his achievements and visited by thousands of his followers every year.